taking place in the context of our masterclass series, which is a series of lectures and workshops that we primarily provide to our graduate students for additional training, to get in contact with leading figures in the field, and to hear all the new things that are happening uh, in the field of psychology. We thought that this year, given that we have been lucky enough, despite the difficult times that um, we're running as a country, to invite very prominent figures to come in. So we thought that it would be a good idea to open up um, the series to the entire mental health community in Athens and hopefully in Greece in the future. Um, our program as a training program has more of an integrated nature. So we're trying to invite people from different theoretical orientations. I was the one who introduced um, the previous lecturer who was more of a CBT lecturer. So I'm going to let the more psychodynamic um, person in our program to introduce Dr. McWilliams to you. So enjoy the lecture. And Dr. Takis. Γίνεται στις ειδικές υγείας στην Ελλάδα που θα ξεκινήσω στα ελληνικά. Γιατί μας ενδιαφέρει να κέψουμε και τσακουστώσεις του προγράμματός μας. Κατά κάποιο τρόπο, ας πούμε, να μπορέσουμε να ετοιμάσουμε και τους επιγραμματίες που θα δουλέψουμε στο ελληνικό χώρο και να έχουμε και μια σχέση παραπάνω με την κοινότητα των συναδέλφων. I'm switching to English now. So, I would tell you a few words about Dr. Mark Williams. She's a clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst. She's a teacher at Rutgers University, the university's graduate school of applied and professional psychology and practices in Flemington, New Jersey. She is the author of three very important books. All of them are translated in Greek, two of them you can find over there. And also a associate editor of the Psychodynamic Diagnostic Manual, the PDM. And uh, she is also former president of the Division 39 of Psychoanalytic Division of the American Psychological Association and chosen as, of the, as one of the three important psychotherapists which are videotaped for training purposes uh, by the ADA. <coughs> so, Dr. Nash Williams, thank you very much. Είμαι πολύ για τα σημερινά προβλήματα οικονομικά σας και ελπίζω τα πράγματα θα βελτιωθούν σύντομα. Δυστυχώς, I can't lecture in Greek about psychotherapy. Um, I will speak in English from here on, which I'm much better at doing. And uh, I, I don't have a PowerPoint. There are some slides that are very minimal that go with this. If you want them, I can send them to me so you can get them. Yeah. Um, I don't like using PowerPoint when I teach. It sort of gets between me and the audience. I'm an old-fashioned teacher that way. If I talk too fast, I know you're all very fluent in English, but it's hard to listen in a second language. So if I talk too fast, put your hand up and go like that. <laughs> and if, can you all hear me okay? If, if that gets hard, start making this gesture and I'll be sure I'm close enough to the microphone. So why did I choose this topic to talk about. I've been thinking about this for the past couple of years and uh, running my ideas past audiences of therapists. Um, when I came of age as a therapist um, about 40 years ago, there was a lively conversation going on among psychotherapists and also in the general public about what is mental health? There were controversies about whether we are trying to adjust people to a sick society. Um, was there some less culturally defined notion of what health is? 
We had people like Maslow writing about the hierarchy of needs. Marie Jehoda wrote a book about uh, uh, mental health. There was Thomas Sass and the anti-psychiatry movement and movies like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest in which the patients seemed healthier than the staff of the hospital. Um, I've been struck by the lack of a conversation about that in recent times. Even the term uh, mental health seems to have become endangered. In the United States, we have renamed most of our facilities behavioral health. And of course, this is a reaction to partly the cognitive behavioral movement in psychology. But in a subtle way, it also conveys the idea that our job is to just shape up people's behavior until they're no longer inconvenient to the rest of us. Um, in the United States, in the past 20 years, psychotherapy has been very controlled by private insurance companies. And they like to take the most minimal definition of improvement that they can, namely, has your depression gone down on the back depression inventory, or has your symptom become less severe? And because of this narrow focus, which is very much in the interest of the insurance companies who don't want to spend money, we are hearing more and more about discrete disorder categories and how you apply an evidence-based treatment to those categories. But we're talking less and less about what we want for our patients in terms of their growth, their eventual health, their overall uh, improvement in function. I would argue, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit tomorrow, that therapists have been put under a lot of pressure to make a kind of identity shift. I don't know if this is as true in Greece as it is in the United States, but we used to like to think of ourselves as healers. We would get into a relationship with a patient and we would mutually try to make something healing start to happen, a process would start. And we're being pressured to redefine ourselves as technicians who provide specific techniques that you apply to discrete disorder categories. And it's subtle, but it's been worrying me. It seems quite pervasive. And I think it's very much influenced by the paradigms that the drug companies like to use. It's certainly in their interest to just define things as discrete disorders because then they can market their drugs for those disorders. It's certainly in the interest of insurance companies because if you narrow your focus of what you're doing, people don't stay in therapy so long. And it's also convenient to people in academic <coughs> psychology for whom it's much easier to research something narrow where you can do a short-term intervention and take, methods be take measurements before <coughs> and after and show whether there are measurable changes in symptoms. And I understand all those paradigms, but they are having, I think, a kind of corrupting effect on the way therapists even think about our work. For example, insurance companies tend to call us providers. <coughs> that's, a, that's a very commercial metaphor. It's very different from healer or companion on a journey or some of the other metaphors that have been part of psychotherapy. So um, I began to see that we were in trouble with this sort of paradigm shift. I guess about 15 years ago, I was um, brought to a very um, well-regarded Hospital. In fact, it's a, it, it's a hospital that's run by the United States Air Force to treat people if they have serious psychological problems. Uh, service people can come back. If you have a psychotic break in Afghanistan or you mm -hmm. get traumatized in Korea, you'd be flown back to this hospital. And when they brought me in to do some teaching, they did what psychiatric facilities often do with lecturers. They, they, they give them their hardest patients and have you interview these people in front of all the medical residents. 
And so they did that with two patients that the staff was very puzzled by. And in both cases, um, the person ended up telling me a lot more than anybody on the staff had known before. So I was feeling good about how it went. But as I was leaving, I heard one of the young psychiatrists say to another one, that is a great line that she uses. I'm going to use that line with my patients. Now, I don't experience myself as having a bunch of pre-formulated lines. Um, so I got curious, and I went over to him and said, I, I, I couldn't help overhear it. I wonder what line was it that captured your attention? And he said, can you say more about that? <laughs> <laughs> he had been trained on the DSM. Is it more than two weeks or less than two weeks? Check the box. And I thought, this is going in a bad direction. Because these were, um, these were not second-rate psychiatrists. These were people who were at the top of their profession. So that's, that's what caused me to start thinking, can we talk about what we're trying to help people toward, not just what kinds of suffering we'd like them to feel a little bit less. I think there is kind of a hunger for this. And I think you're seeing it in the positive psychology movement uh, in the United States. Another uh, effect of it is the interest in mindfulness, in Buddhism and Eastern religions, in yoga and other whole person kinds of practices. There's a wish to talk more about what are we wanting to go toward. I had the experience when I uh, was going around, right after the PDM came out in uh, 2006, I was spent a year or two lecturing to audiences about what we had been trying to do with that. And one of the things I said to them was, one problem with the DSM and the ICD, for that matter, is it has no concept of mental health, except for the absence of symptoms, mm -hmm. unless you count the GAF scale. But there, all the criteria are pretty much external observation. Does the person hold a job? Does the person have a relationship? But most of us, when we actually diagnose on the GAF scale, go sort of like that. Um, so I would say to audiences, um, there's no consideration in our diagnostic habits in this new categorical model. And I'm saying new because for me, I saw what happened when we shifted in 1980 from a more inferential, dimensional kind of talking about people to a more categorical, disorder category way of talking about people. Um, the problem with it is that there's no sort of concept of mental health. And all the things that have been important to therapists, such as affect regulation, authenticity, the capacity to uh, maintain your self-esteem under stress, to have realistic self-esteem, to understand the motives of others, to be able to love and work and play, to accept things that can't be changed. I started, you know, I, and I saw people wildly writing down this list of things. And they would tell me afterward, that was a great list. And I realized they weren't being taught this anymore. So I tried to put together um, what I think is a, a pretty good representation of the way the mental health community has traditionally thought about what is mental health. Now this is, of course, you can't separate this from culture. And there are some cultures in which certain kinds of attitudes are much more adaptive than certain other cultures. Uh, so I, I don't want to be too... Um, opinionated about this being the list. But here's the list that I've put together that I think represents pretty well what therapists have come to think of as what we are working toward. And I think this goes beyond people's theoretical orientation. My cognitive behavioral colleagues have the same problems that I do with the insurance companies. My, uh, Judith Beck said to me, you know, the problem is they don't get that we treat people, not disorders. So let me talk about people and what we've come to think they mean. Um, the first three things I'm going to talk about probably include all the others. And they are love, work, and play. And by the way, I have a list of 16 of these categories that I'm 
sort of working on. And I'm hoping eventually that this will be a book. My editor has been after me for years to write a book that might cross over into a popular book or a book for educated lay people. And I, I do think there might be a place for a, for a book on this topic. So I'm starting to work on one. I may do it with my daughter, who's a political scientist. And we may sort of, between us, talk about the cultural level of health, healthy civilizations, healthy polities, as well as individual health. Let me talk about love and work and play. Um, this is what Freud said when he was asked, what are you helping people toward? Or what is your definition of mental health? He never put this in writing. Uh, the main place we have as a source for this is Eric Erickson, who wrote about Freud saying, uh, when he was asked, uh, what do you think defines mental health? Freud said, the capacity to love and to work. And Erickson wrote that in Childhood and Society, and people have remembered that. It resonates. Um, Richard Sturba, who died fairly recently, was one of the last people who had known Freud, said that Freud did make that comment periodically, but very often he also added, and of course, enjoyment, joy, play. So I, I'm thinking love, work, and play have a long history as <coughs> ideas that um, we think are, are important for people to have a capacity to engage in. Now, in the middle of the last century, a lot of psychiatrists and psychologists, uh, including some analysts, defined love very, very conventionally. You should have a monogamous, heterosexual relationship with one other person and have children and so forth. I, I don't think Freud meant the term quite that uh, stereotypically. I think he would say that uh, adult to adult love involves the capacity to be fully yourself in a relationship with one other person, could be a same-sex person, and to understand that person as they are and to love them as they are. A lot of people get in trouble in life because they keep trying to improve their partner and, uh, and they don't really accept the person that they made a commitment to. Um, in adult-child relationships, love would mean a combination of devotion and integrity, such that the child could have a, what we think of now as a safe harbor in terms of attachment theory. The capacity to have an authentic, intimate, devoted relationship with at least one other person seems to me to be very, very central to uh, mental health. In terms of work, I don't think he meant holding a job or bringing, necessarily bringing home money. He meant that uh, healthy people have things that they do that they feel make a difference or give life meaning somehow. It could be volunteer work, it could be raising children. <laughs> One of the big problems of contemporary young people and I think you must have this problem even more in Greece than in the United States, is that it's very hard for young adults to feel that they matter. Uh, if they're having trouble getting employment, if, um, if they don't see that anything they do has an effect on anything, it's, uh, it, it undermines their overall sense of mental health. A lot of contemporary uh, teenagers in the United States have a much higher suicide rate than they did uh, three decades ago. And uh, I don't think anything has changed biologically. I think it gets harder and harder <coughs> to be a teenager as the space between when you become a biological adult and when your culture says you're actually important is getting longer and longer and longer. And you see people suffering when they don't feel that their life matters. We often throw recreation at our adolescent and young adult people. Um, and that will certainly distract them. But it doesn't give them a feeling of meaning. That's part of um, having work that matters to you. In terms of play, um, 
I'm thinking about the work of people like <coughs> Erickson and Winnicott, who emphasized play and talked about what it was doing symbolically and what kinds of capacities that play seems to organize in us and saw a continuum between the rough and tumble play of the child and the imagination of the child and the capacity for the adult to play in more symbolic ways. Uh, most cultures have some ways of dancing together, singing together, celebrating together. I've often wondered what it's doing to our mental health to have cultures now that are such spectator cultures. We watch athletic events, we go to concerts, you know, we, we, we watch dance performances. We don't uh, do it quite as much with each other as in more traditional societies. But I'm also thinking of um, Jacques Panksepp's work. Uh, I know some of you must know his work. He's uh, written a, a very good book called Affective Neuroscience, which is about 30 years of research with mammals uh, on their emotional brain. And he has a new book out with uh, Lucy Bivin as well. Um, Yacht will be here in, in Athens uh, in mid-June. The neuropsychoanalysis group, I think some of you may be connected with that, mm -hmm. is having a conference here. I'm coming back for that, as a matter of fact, because um, I, I find it a very exciting conference. And if you get a chance to hear Jakob Pinkset, he's fascinating. He, I don't know how he survived in academia, because I know when he started, the dominant paradigm was you couldn't assume that animals think and feel. And the fact that he was looking at animal affect made him a real outlier. Uh, but he studied it for <coughs> more than 30 years now. And one of the things that he's learned is that mammals need to play. He's doing something very interesting now. He's kind of revised drive theory. You know, in the Freudian drive theory, there's libido and thanatos. Um, he, he's got a list of seven drives that he thinks you can make an argument for existing in the brain. And one of them is play. And the reason he thinks of it as a drive or a need is that if you put any two mammals of the same species together when they're young, they'll get involved in rough and tumble play. And uh, he calls it a need because if you prevent it on Monday, they'll do twice as much of it on Tuesday. It's like REM sleep. There's a, a rebound effect. Uh, this is true of male and female animals. They very carefully keep the dominance and submission ratio between them. You know, they, they, they shift to 60%, 40% dominant and submission, and they, and they switch roles. If it gets to 70%, dominance, 30% submission in either direction, they suddenly act as if they know it's not play anymore and they go into their dominant submission postures. But this rough and tumble play seems to be very important in the brain for establishing the capacity to concentrate and to um, think and to increase your executive function somehow. I'm not enough of a brain scientist to know how that happens. But uh, Dr. Panksepp has this fascinating theory that one of the reasons we're seeing more attention deficit disorder is that our children aren't getting as much rough and tumble play as they need. We park them in front of computers and televisions and we send them to classes in things, but they don't have that sort of organic rough and tumble play. If you go to see him this summer, ask him to show you his um, films of him tickling mice. Um, if you turn up the volume in ways such that we can hear what the mice hear, you hear them laughing. <laughs> you see him tickling a mouse and the mouse comes and gets tickled and then runs back to the other mice and they laugh and then they come back and they get tickled again and they run back and they laugh again. It, it, um, changed my attitude about using uh, rat poison in <laughs> because these are obviously mammals who are sharing so many things with us. Uh, anyway, he's a very good lecturer, and I encourage you to go to that neuropsychoanalysis conference. 
So certainly love, work, and play are part of mental health. If people can't <coughs> love, can't work and find meaning, and can't play, there's some problem. The fourth thing on my list is um, one of the things that we try to help them with is uh, to move toward a more secure attachment pattern. There is now a vast research on uh, early attachment and its consequences. We know that um, there are different attachment styles. Uh, only some of them are secure. Uh, they're secure, anxious, avoidant, and there's a type that was found later, and these have been measured uh, via the work of Mary Ainsworth and Mary Main, the students of John Bowlby. Uh, there's a fourth type that they call type D, disoriented, disorganized attachments. Uh, and they're pretty much what they sound like. These are, these are attachment styles that they have discerned from uh, research in the strange situation paradigm, where you, you take a mother and a child, and you separate the child and get it involved in some activity, <clears throat> and you watch how the child handles the separation, and then how they handle the reunion with the mother. And securely attached children don't show a lot of anxiety about going off and playing. And when the play is over, they go back and they, in an uncomplicated way, are happy to see their parent. The anxious children are very upset about separating. They seem very preoccupied in the play. And they often regress and cry when they have uh, the reunion with the parent. The avoidant children, and, and I'll talk about this a little bit more tomorrow because I'm talking about schizoid dynamics tomorrow. The avoidant children look kind of indifferent to the separation. But if you take measurements on them physiologically, they are handling a lot of anxiety. And there's, there, there's starting to be evidence that they've been given the message that the caregiver can't tolerate their dependency. So they act precociously not needy, and then when they have a reunion with the parent, they act a little bit indifferent about being back with the parent. The, the type D is the disorganized, disoriented type in which uh, you see this when there's been trauma, uh, severe and chronic trauma especially, where the object of attachment is also the object of fear, so that the child will cling to the person and maybe bite her. So the anxious, avoidant, and disorganized types, and there are subtypes of those, are the people who most come to us for psychotherapy. And at a kind of nonverbal level, we are trying to help them move toward the capacity for more secure attachment. Philip Shaver's research has shown that there are two conditions under which attachment styles seem to change. One of the interesting things about the attachment literature is there's a lot of continuity between how one is tested in a strange situation at, let's say, age three, and how one scores at age 23 or 33 on the adult attachment uh, inventory. So there, there's a lot of continuity with these insecure attachment styles, but the two conditions that shift one's uh, attachment toward a more are a love relationship, committed partnership or marriage of at least five years, and intensive psychotherapy of any kind for at least two years. So I think we've always known that we were doing that for people. We talked about it in different language, basic trust, ontological security. We had many terms for it. But what we're attuned to there is something that symptom categorization doesn't get near. It's what keeps me in the job in many ways. I, I've been working for many years now with an extremely paranoid man, and I remember vividly in the third year of his treatment, he walked in and he said, um, the most extraordinary thing just happened. And I thought he was going to tell me about some external event. I said, what was that? He said, coming here and then walking up your stairs, I found myself thinking, I'm going to feel better after I talk to Nancy about this. And I've never felt that toward anybody in my life. To me, that was much more important in terms of what he's been struggling with, that he actually could now imagine comfort. Uh, you know, of course, right afterward, he, he got scared and got more paranoid for a while. But, you know, the, over, the trend over time is, is toward much more secure attachment. Um, 
I, I just got an email from him. He used to go completely off the rails whenever I went to another country. And now he just tells me that he's a little pissed off that I'm leaving him again. But he, he, he seems fine with it. And that's a big change. And much more important to me than any particular score that he gets on any particular measure of discomfort. Um, this, the fifth thing on my list is a sense of agency. This has been talked about in different languages, too. Erickson, I think, was talking about this with his concept of autonomy. I kind of prefer the idea of a sense of agency. There's something so radically individualistic about the idea that we're autonomous. Um, although I suppose technically it means self-government, and there is something that that word does capture in that sense. Um, I think this is what uh, positive psychologists are now calling self-efficacy. <laughs> it's the sense that you have choices, that in an older psychology language, there's some internal locus of control. Um, I was very interested in, as to whether this was culturally very Western. Uh, and I have had the good fortune to teach in some countries that are very much more Eastern and collectivist. I've taught in China and in Turkey and Singapore. And I've asked the therapist there, you know, you're a culture that has all these interrelated assumptions of obligation from one person to another. Do you have the concept of individual agency in a culture like this? And they said, oh yes, I mean, we're very interdependent, but we know the difference between a person who within that web of relationships feels they have some options about how to discharge their obligations and people who don't. Uh, the patients who don't have a sense of agency uh, are the ones that say things like, um, well, I don't know, what do you mean when you ask them, is that what you wanted? Uh, I'm seeing a lot of teenage girls contemporarily who are involved in kind of precocious sexual behavior. And I'll say to them, is that what your body was telling you you wanted to do? And they look at me like I have three heads because it never occurred to them that that should be part of the equation. They didn't have a sense of agency. You know, the head of the football team asked them for oral sex, and so they did it. It seemed like the thing that the environment was asking of them. Um, this, this kind of sense that I have some control over my own life it is, of course, always incomplete because it's an illusion that we have a lot of control. So much of what happens to us is beyond our control. But even if you're in a prison, you have some capacity to decide who you're going to talk to and who you're not, and whether you're going to exercise in your cell and whether you're not. Um, and having a sense of agency is uh, a great relief for many people who have been able only to conceptualize themselves as helpless victims up until um, psychotherapy. The sixth thing that I have is um, a sense of self and object constancy, or what uh, Kernberg, following Erickson, called identity integration. Uh, that was one of the original criteria for trying to understand the difference between people who could talk about a conflict as if they saw that they had a neurosis. And people who were obviously suffering and who weren't psychotic, but who shifted from one self-state to another and didn't, couldn't stand in the spaces, if you will, as Philip Bromberg says, couldn't sort of see that the raging person that they were on Monday is the, is the same person that's grateful to you on Tuesday, and he couldn't put those parts of themselves together. So one aspect of having self-continuity, self-constancy, and by projection, object constancy, is that you can contain conflict, you can see both sides of how you feel, you can experience ambivalence, you cannot dissociate when you're under stress. Um, you, 
hear this in patients. Often when they're talking about themselves, they talk in either all good or all bad terms, and they don't seem to have any sense that those things are part of the same person. And you especially hear it when you ask them to talk about other people. If I don't have self-constancy, I don't have object constancy either. I don't see continuity in other people. So if, for example, I ask a patient, tell me about your father, and the person says, well, he was difficult. I loved him very much, but he had been in the military, and he tried to operate the family like it was a military encampment, and he was too harsh but he was there for every game I played and he stood by me when I was in trouble. You very quickly get the picture in your head of a very three-dimensional person with good qualities and bad qualities. Some people, though, when you ask them, tell me about your father, will say, well, he's a monster. I don't want to talk about him. Or, he was a saint. I just want to be like him. Or, they'll go, I don't know. He was just my bad. They'll be either all good, all bad, or very vague. And that's, that's presumptive evidence that there's some problem they have putting those things together. There is a temporal, a time component of self and object constancy as well. If you have self-constancy, you can look back on yourself as a young person and feel some continuity with who you were. And you can look ahead and imagine where you might be in 10 years. But we have many patients who can't remember their childhood or have absolutely no compassion for who they were as a child. And when you ask them, where do you see yourself in 10 years, they don't have the faintest idea how to answer that question. They're just trying to survive. So there is that time part of it. There's also something about one's relationship to one's body that I think is part of self-constancy. Uh, we're seeing a lot of pathologies at this time in history that involve a dissociation from the body. Eating disorders, um, uh, the uh, narcissistic disorders that send people to get endless cosmetic surgeries, um, and other ways of seeing the... I've been very just interested in how people with disordered eating talk about their body. It's as if it's another, it's, it's a, somebody else that inhabits them. They're starving that person, or they're feeding that person. Um, rather than, it's me. I'm taking care of myself. The body is kind of dissociated in this way. Of you see that in sexuality a lot, too. Um, people that get involved in very intense, overstimulating sexual actions that don't seem to have any integration with the rest of their life at all and seem to be compulsive for them and not particularly exciting in the general sense. There are different subjective experiences of a lack of constancy. Some people have a more depressive version of it. Um, which is, these are the patients where if, if you're away, if it's between sessions, if you're taking a vacation, they feel you don't exist. And they can't imagine that you keep an image of them in your head. Um, but there's also a type, uh, a more paranoid version of a problem with object constancy, which um, shows itself in what Sullivan called malevolent transformation. It's not that you're gone, it's that you've turned into an evil version of yourself. And that's also very jarring when we're sitting with a patient and we say something we, we thought was sensitive and immediately if we're, we're subsumed into a paranoid context and we were trying to humiliate them from the patient's point of view. You have to log a lot of time with a person who has that kind of problem, either type of uh, object constancy problem, um, in order to help them slowly put those images together and realize that the same person that frustrates them or isn't there is the person who is also there. The seventh thing on my list is uh, ego strength, or uh, the more contemporary term for this is resilience. 
there are other terms as well, the synthetic function of the ego, but what these various terms all refer to is that we hope that our patients get more able to tolerate stress without either regressing, getting sick, or acting out, or depending on just one defense. There are different ways of, of adapting to stress maladaptively. One is to get helpless and just complain and not be able to find any way to address it. Another is to get sick. Um, another is that maybe your central defense is projection. And whatever happens to you, you project. Or your central defense is dissociation, and whatever happens, you project. This kind of rigidity um, doesn't allow you to learn from painful experience. You just go on automatic pilot. We don't still understand a lot about resilience and why some people can go through significant trauma and become more resilient, whereas some people are destroyed by it. In the psychoanalytic community, we used to think that if you got a really good start in your first few years, you were pretty much inoculated against later stress. You could go through severe problems later, and you'd have a good foundation, and you wouldn't be too badly hurt by them. There is some truth in that. but. <coughs> If you've read the work of Gislaine Boulanger, for example, we have underestimated the extent to which extreme stress can damage even quite psychologically healthy people in adulthood. <coughs> and we're seeing this now in the United States with people coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq who are destroyed, who were perfectly fine people before they just had one too many friends destroyed in their presence. Um, there's a long literature. It's about trauma and might. I'm beginning to think that cultures go through cycles of being able to face trauma and then cycles of completely dissociating or denying it. Um, we've had so many different words for war trauma. <coughs> Back in World War I, we talked about the war neuroses or the, the war hysterias about shell shock or battle fatigue. In World War II, it was, um, I guess the shell shock was World War II. And now we're calling it PTSD. Some of you probably know Jonathan Shea's book, Achilles in Vietnam, where he talks about how Homer describes Achilles in ways that are completely consonant with our understanding of somebody with post-traumatic stress disorder. This, we, we know this. Every time we have a major war, we see how it destroys people that seem to have resilience, and at a certain point, they lose it. On the other hand, we also see patients, if, if your patients are like mine, they often come thinking, when you hear my story, you're going to think I'm really sick. <laughs> and I never have that reaction. My internal reaction is much more likely to be, my God, given all that you've gone through, how did you preserve so much good capacity? And with some patients, it's particularly um, striking that they've been able to take lemons and make them into lemonade. So helping people with their ego strength, um, their capacity to respond to stress, their capacity to respond specifically to the stress rather than going on an automatic defense has always been a part of psychotherapy. Uh, the next thing on my list is um, a realistic and reliable sense of self-esteem. We've seen a lot of perversions of the idea of self-esteem in recent decades. The early psychoanalysts were working in cultures that were somewhat harsh and patriarchal and uh, hard on children in terms of um, being very, em and putting a lot of emphasis on discipline. And so when they wrote about trying to help people with their self-esteem, 
they tended to write about it in terms of trying to soften a superego that was too harsh. They had a lot of patients who were very self-hating, who were perfectionistic, who felt they were always falling short of their family's ideals and their own internalized ideals, and they were unrealistically hard on themselves. In contemporary practice, we still see some of those patients, but we also see the kind of opposite side, where people don't feel too hard on themselves. They've been brought up with so much of a message that you're wonderful, you're perfect, there's no problem with my child, that they feel sort of fraudulent. Um, and they, they don't have a realistic way of supporting their self-esteem because their parental reactions have been, but you're wonderful. You know, when the teacher, the teachers have complained to me that 30 years ago, they used to send a note home, can you, could we talk about Johnny? I think he's having a problem in reading. And the teacher would come in and, I mean, the parent would come in and talk with the teacher and they would try to figure out how to help Johnny. And they, they tell me now you're likely to get a parent who storms in saying, there's nothing wrong with my child and I won't have you say that about it. When children get those messages that everybody gets A's and everybody has prizes, they know there's some way in which that doesn't compute. And they, in that case, they haven't been given enough of a superego, if you will, a, a kind that is realistic about congratulating yourself when you do well and being able to take criticism either from the self or others when you don't do well. I actually find it's easier to work with the first kind of person than the second kind of person. It's kind of easier to hack away at, at a self uh, it's self-talk that's too harsh than it is to build something that wasn't there in the first place. Um, Martha Wolfenstein did a very interesting study in the 1960s when psychoanalysis was endemic in the United States, often very misunderstood, and everybody was trying to get rid of hang-ups and get rid of harsh superegos, and there were a whole lot of schools for young people that try to not give them a harsh superego. So they were told, we want you to just have fun. You don't have to work hard, just enjoy yourself. Mm -hmm. Martha Wolfenstein decided to study those children and she interviewed them in these preschools, mostly on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And she found that the children had just as much self-criticism as children who were brought up in environments that uh, told them you have to work hard and strive and struggle, the children would say to her, um, I don't think I'm having enough fun. <laughs> My parents would be disappointed in me. I'm not enjoying myself. <laughs> so you're, you're going to get this self-taught anyway. You might as well have it be about something that actually is morally enlivening. Um, Occasionally, I will have a patient who, for example, uh, is, is deciding to get through life by getting various government agencies to decide that he or she is hopelessly uh, psychologically damaged and therefore they'll pay for this person. And I believe strongly in those kinds of services and classifications being available to people, but I don't like to see my patients not fight it. And, and I find myself saying to them, how are you going to feel good about yourself if, you, if you're just sitting at home being taken care of by the government? Is there anything that you think you could do? So That's an example of the difficulty sort of building something if the person doesn't have that already internalized sense of uh, there's something I want to accomplish, there are standards I hold myself to. That gets us toward the, the next um, topic, which is I think there's something about mental health that involves a sense of values, some kind of sense of ethics or integrity. Um, mm -hmm. Psychopathic people. Um, have been recognized as having something wrong with them mm -hmm. for a couple of centuries. The first term that people used for their problem was moral insanity. There are people who seem to be okay, but they have 
no moral center really. They they view other people as just objects to manipulate. They organize their self-esteem around whether they feel powerful. They don't have a range of affect except for maybe rage and envy. Uh, they take great pleasure in fooling other people. They often have a lot of charm. They have a contempt for weakness. Here is one of my strongest disagreements with the DSM. When the DSM shifted in 1980 to try to make it easier for researchers to do research on topics by defining them by externally observable stuff, which I understand, by the way. Researchers were going crazy. What they would say to a therapist, I'd like to do research on narcissistic personality disorder. What are the diagnostic criteria? And if the therapist said, well, you take the person into treatment and you see if a self-object transference develops, <laughs> that's no help to them at all. So I understand why we had to go in the direction of giving them something that was external and categorical. But in the criteria for the DSM definition of antisocial personality disorder, there's only one criterion that is internal and that's lack of remorse. And that was only put there because therapists complained that that is the central thing, that the person can't take the perspective of other people. Um, a lot of people think of uh, psychopathy as an attachment disorder, that the child for some reason feels that the early uh, adults in their environment are either too abusive, too negligent, too <coughs> self-preoccupied, or too inconsistent to attach to. So what do you attach to? Your own power. You don't really have the capacity to love because you haven't really taken that in. The DSM normed its antisocial uh, personality criteria on prison inmates. And as a result, those criteria overdiagnose people who are not psychopathic but are in criminal subcultures. They don't have that raw power orientation. And they underdiagnose people who are really good at it and who stayed out of jail and never were diagnosed as a conduct disorder. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to read a rather chilly book about high-functioning psychopaths, I would recommend Babiak and Hare's book, Snakes in Suits. It's about corporate psychopaths. There was recently a study by Harvard Business School that found that where the dominant personality of the corporate senior executive used to be obsessive compulsive, it's now narcissistic board bordering on psychopathic. This does not bode well for the rest of us. So to therapists, these internal aspects are critical. And when we work with people who have um, a gap or a hole in their capacity to care about the effect of their behavior on other people, it's hard work because you can't make connections with those people via compassion. They just think you're weak. You have to get their respect by talking tough to them. But you can move them along a little bit toward more capacity to attach. And I think we see, when we see that coldness, which we often experience as a kind of chill in the countertransference, we know that we're working on something very primary here about whether the person can even value other people. The tenth thing on my list is affect tolerance and affect regulation. Um, part of mental health is the capacity to feel a whole range of feelings without necessarily acting on them or being too upset that one has them. I would say that thought tolerance is part of mental health. That if you're mentally healthy, you can allow yourself any thoughts and not feel that they're dangerous. Theodore Wright used to say that uh, the difference between uh, a neurotic person and a non-neurotic person was that the non-neurotic person could look in the window of a jewelry store and admire what was there and even have the fantasy if I didn't have a conscience, I would love to steal that. <laughs> and the neurotic person would look in a window at, of a jewelry store and run the other way. They couldn't tolerate that thought. There's some very good work going on in Germany now by a man named Reiner Krause, who is studying affects. Um, 
And I've been very interested in his work, partly because Sylvan Tompkins was one of my mentors. And Sylvan studied the face and facial affect. Some of you know Paul Ekman's work. Paul was a uh, student of Sylvan's as well. The face has about nine affects that it cycles through. And they're universally recognized across cultures. And one of the things that Krause discovered was that in severe psychopathology, the face freezes. In normal affect, uh, not transmission, but just experience, affects shift as frequently as every eight seconds. If you watch anybody's face, if you're in any kind of conversation, the affects go across their face very quickly and they keep changing. But if you think about people with severe depression, you get that dead face. Or people with extreme anxiety, you get the frozen face. Or people who are paranoid, they tend to look down and to the left. Um, Sylvan Tompkins used to say that was expressing a compromise between fear and shame, which are the main affects in paranoia. Uh, in fear, the eyes dart horizontally to the left. In shame, they go down. And paranoid people will tend to talk to you like this, looking down to the left. Um, so frozen affect, you can actually measure on the face. Krause has also discovered that all of us have a unique fractal, if you will. Uh, there are, we, we go through the same, we have our favorite emotions, and they cycle across our face in predictable ways. And he has analyzed many people's sort of pattern of facial affect. So in normal affect, it changes a lot, and also we quickly, uh, affectively. So if your teenage child is talking to you like this, in about a millisecond, you'll be talking like this. <laughs> Krause has videotaped pairs of patients and therapists. Therapists came from all different orientations, I think mainly psychodynamic, cognitive behavioral, and humanistic and systems. And these were patients who had not done well in two prior therapies, so they were thought of as treatment resistant patients. And he analyzed the videotapes of the patients um, after a period of therapy. And in those therapies, in which both the patient and the therapist agreed that great progress had been made, they were characterized by what he called abnormal affect in the therapist. In other, I love this concept, the therapist had abnormal affect. I think it's like what Vian called containment. That you know, the patient comes in with, let's say, fear. And we show curiosity about why they're afraid. Or they come in with shame. And we, should, we show anger that someone shamed them. We give back something different. And it starts to create in them this sense at a completely nonverbal level. There's a different way to feel about this. When he, when he asked the therapist, how do you account for helping the patient, they all responded in terms of their favorite theory of psychotherapy. None of them said, it's because my facial affect didn't match the facial affect of the patient. But that was what was consistent across therapies in which the patient really changed. And if you looked very carefully at the videos, what you saw was not just that they didn't match, but that they started out with a very brief matching that then went somewhere else. And it looks very much like the videotapes of Beatrice Beebe, for example, with mothers and infants, where the mother will mark the infant's feeling and then quickly take it somewhere else. So you've got an infant in distress, and a healthy mother will say, oh, maybe you're hungry. <laughs> so you get a moment, of, a moment of mirroring taken somewhere else. So our theories often say a lot about mirroring, but there's something more going on here. We mirror, but we, 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 by our feeling, not just our words, we're giving some other message as well. Another aspect of affect tolerance and regulation, I think, is the capacity to feel affect in the moment, to feel it now, to enjoy it. Sometimes when my patients are upset, when we uncover that they're angry at me, I will say things like, well, I not only want you to notice your anger at me, I'm hoping you'll eventually enjoy it. The idea that you could enjoy even negative affects, like, 
why, why, why were there Greek tragedies? Because there's something wonderful about feeling deep affect, even painful affect, that people who are not scared of their emotions are able to do. Um, I guess the other, the one other thing I want to say about Krause's work, which fascinated me, was that he found that when therapists and patients of any orientation start using metaphors, that's when you see that correlates with change. That metaphors seem to exist on the boundary between affect and more thoroughgoing changes. So that's the affective part of um, mental health, I think. There's also a more cognitive part that we've sometimes called insight, we've sometimes called the ego alien quality of symptoms, we've sometimes called it reality testing or insight into illness. We know that the patient who understands that he or she has a disorder <coughs> is much healthier than the patient who just has the disorder and blames. Um, there's a huge difference between a young woman who is in her first year at the university and who comes to a college counseling center saying, I started to put on weight and I started to try to control it by vomiting and I'm afraid I'm getting an eating disorder. Um, that woman you can probably help in three or four sessions. And another woman may have the identical DSM criteria for bulimia. But she comes in and, and she doesn't quite know why she's there. Her roommates have insisted that she come to the counseling center because they've heard her vomiting. And when you interview her, she says, this is the way my mother taught me to control my weight and I don't see anything wrong with it. It's going to take you a year and a half before she separates enough psychologically from her mother before she really sees that this is a problem to her at some deep level. So there's always been this attunement in the therapeutic community. Can you, yeah, maybe you have some troubles, but can you see that they're troubles? When people see that they're having a psychotic break, they're much easier to help than when they're simply psychotic. Um, Let me move on so we'll have time for questions. The capacity to mentalize other people. I think this is also talked about in different names. In, in philosophy, we call this theory of mind. It's the capacity to understand the separate subjective experiences of other people. It's what Jessica Benjamin would call recognition. Um, I would say our training of therapists is a progressive effort to help people mentalize what it's like to be all different kinds of people. This is a huge part of our training as psychotherapists, to try to get people to feel their way into what it's like to be someone else. Not just diagnostically what it's like to be schizoid as opposed to depressive, for example, but what it's like to be a twin, or a person who was adopted, or a person with a congenital illness, or a person with a constitutional defect. Um, there are, it's endless the way we have to stretch ourselves. If we don't do this, we just project. And we can feel this. When a patient doesn't have this capacity to see other people's separate minds, it's, it's something that we register. For example, uh, one man that I started working with, after a few sessions, uh, I noticed that every time he started talking about pain, his suffering, he would abruptly change the subject. So I brought it up to him and I said, I think I'm seeing a pattern that when you really start feeling sad or, or in pain, you abruptly change the subject. And he said, oh yeah, I know I do that. And I said, well, what's your idea about why you do that? And I think I expected him to say something like, I don't want to cry, or I'm not ready to go there yet, or I'm self-conscious. But what he said was, well, I can see I'm hurting you. Okay. He saw sympathetic sadness on my face, and he felt he was damaging me and had to stop talking. That's an inability to imagine me as having a separate psychology who could feel for him without suffering the same degree he was suffering. And once I got that message from him, I realized this was going to be a longer therapy than I thought. <laughs> okay. 
Um, this, by the way, is the reason that psychoanalysts have historically emphasized whether a person is more pre edible or edible, to use an old language. The, the reason for the value put on going through the edible phase is not so much the fantasies that characterize this phase, you know, the competition with one parent for the other and fantasies of retaliation. It's that if you can have those fantasies, you have made a developmental leap away from the egocentricity of the two-year-old. You can imagine that two other people have a relationship with each other that's not about you. Okay, so we use the metaphor of Oedipal for that. But it's really the same thing that Peter Fonagy talks about as mentalization. All right, the last four I'm going to go through quickly so we have some time. Flexibility of defenses. Um, that was an old criterion in the psychoanalytic literature. Wright talked about character armor, for example. Uh, when you see somebody who doesn't have any flexibility of defenses, they may be in the neurotic range of functioning, but they still may be very sick. For example, there was an agoraphobic woman that I interviewed who could not leave her house. She had many other aspects of mental health. She had good friends. In fact, they took turns babysitting her, so she didn't have to go anywhere. She had a, a good role in her family. She even worked from home, but she couldn't leave her house. Every stress was responded to with, well, I'll just shrink from that. Another man I interviewed was a very obsessive compulsive man. I was trying to find some area of vitality in him. And I said, um, how's your sexual life? And he said, I get the job done. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was a job to him. That's a defense of inflexibility. Uh, the next thing is, this is, uh, I'm drawing on the work of Sidney Black here. There's something about health that involves some kind of balance between the more communal needs of we have, the attachment needs, and the self-definition needs. I'll talk more about this when I talk about depression and masochism in the next two days. But Black has elaborated that these, this polarity underlies many things. For example, he's found out that people who have a, a depression in which the dominant theme is I'm bad, I'm evil, I should attack myself, have very different therapeutic requirements from people whose depression is experienced as I'm empty, I'm hungry, I'm needy, I'm desperate, I need a relationship. They actually need different things from therapists, and it doesn't come down to orientation. It comes down to whether you help them with their uh, unconscious or irrational beliefs versus whether you just try to be a good object to them. And they, they, he did an elegant study on this. And uh, it fits clinical experience as well. And there was a lot of clinical lore about this before he did the empirical work that he's done. But it's, it's clear that you can be psychopathological by being way over on one end of the spectrum, like the psychopathic person who doesn't care at all about other people, or the seriously over-dependent person who defines him or herself completely by other people, that, that we all need to have some balance here. Okay, sense of vitality. Winnicott famously said, a person can be normal without being alive. Um, Christopher Bolas writes about the normal path, I think it is, or the normotic personality, or maybe that's Joyce McDougall. But there's some way in which um, they're trying to capture that you can look sort of conventional, but you don't have passion. You don't have enthusiasm. You don't have vitality. Uh, I have a friend who works with severely traumatized soldiers, and she tells me, we learned eventually to make the, the distinction between those who came back to life and those who simply went on living. Eating disordered people will sometimes say, I want to feel alive. People in the grip of any kind of addictive process will say, I, I don't have any aliveness. So something about vitality has to be in our notion of mental health. And the final thing on my list is the capacity to accept what can't be changed, to mourn, 
to surrender in Immanuel Kant's terms to what is greater than we are. Um, Esther Paul said in this uh, vein, in uh, this lovely book she has, Mating in Captivity, about fidelity and infidelity, <laughs> that the erotic is a paradox that you manage, not a problem that you solve. Some things we just have to accept that they're difficult. I think we do a lot of this with patients. We say, yeah, I, I think your husband may not ever pick up his socks. <laughs> because people can get so organized around, it shouldn't be. This isn't right. It isn't fair. Um, they, they don't just move on. So grieving and moving on, accepting oneself, accepting one's sexuality, accepting one's limitation, and then moving on is a big part of mental health. Um, this may be a particularly American um, problem in mental health because we have this whole ideology of we can do anything. I mean, we tell our children, you can grow up to be anything you want, which is, of course, psychotic. <laughs> but, true. I mean, you can't be a giraffe. But they, they, that's how our kids are, are raised, and it gives them a problem with accepting things that can't be changed. Hirschfeld, the artist, at 99 years old, was still drawing this wonderful art, and somebody said to him, how do you understand your longevity and creativity? And he said, I have a talent for accepting reality. <laughs> so the point of this is that patients don't always come to us capable of conceptualizing overall mental health or wellness. They don't come saying, I don't have object constancy, or I'm not able to be fully authentic. If you've never had it, you don't have even a concept of it. We need to have some image of what is better, or at least possible for our patients, or maybe ideal. And we need to let our surrounding cultures know something about the nature of human mental suffering that goes beyond medicatable disorder categories and focuses again on the challenges of living a fully human life. So I'll stop there and find out what questions or comments have come up in your mind as I've talked. <coughs> and you can ask them in Greek and, and uh, I'll have the translation. Oh, come on, Greek audiences usually <laughs> have something to say. Don't go Scandinavian on me here. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm wondering, what did you do with the case of the patient that uh, thought uh, that you were suffering due to his uh, narration? How did you convince him that you're not suffering and you can't be a public? I Well, first, I said, oh, I didn't realize you were seeing the sympathetic sadness on my face and feeling that you were damaging me. Um, I think there's a lot to be understood about that. Because although I did feel pain on your behalf, I don't feel damaged. Um, so I started there, just trying to make it a little bit ego alien. But it took him three or four years <laughs> before he really gets that um, he's not hurting me. Once we learned more about his history, it was very clear that he got the message all the time that he was hurting his mother, that if she was depressed, it was his fault. And she was very unseparated from him. She, uh, she had a quality that I've seen in the parents of people who become paranoid. Um, she treated him like an extension of herself, only the disowned bad part of herself. So when he asked for a second pastry, instead of saying, I don't think it's a good idea to have two, she said, you're greedy. That's the problem with you. You're greedy. You're selfish. She projected her bad stuff into him and then attacked it. And that's a very confusing message for a child. They get the message that I'm terribly important to the parent because the parent needs me to extrude their dissociated badness. But all I'm getting is criticism. So his solution was to constantly try to make her happy. And that was the closest thing to self-esteem that he had, and we eventually figured that out. But it took, it took quite a while. You can't always immediately say, oh, well, you're understanding that wrong, because that's 
a narcissistic injury to the person. And he and I did go around on that sometimes where um, if I had a, a response like that, he was determined to show me how I wasn't seeing myself well enough. <laughs> and to some extent he was right. I think the relational movement in psychoanalysis is very accurate about the fact that there's always something that the patient is responding to. There's some way in which this is mutually going on. It's not it's not untrue that it's painful to work with a patient like this, that it causes the therapist pain. <coughs> so I try to acknowledge the, the reality in it as well as try to get him a little bit more able to mentalize my suffering. Yes? You talked about resiliency before. Say that again, I missed You talked about resiliency before. Yes. And I was wondering, if it, because we gave examples from the First World War and the Second World War. Mm-hmm. I kind of imagine living in the 21st century that somehow resiliency has changed in the way that we are less than we were once upon a time. I mean, because hardship was kind of a more natural thing maybe in the first world war or before and now this is not the same so I was wondering to agree that we've grown a little more sensitive I don't know I think I have a prejudice to agree with you on that I've thought for example about um, the impact on my own psychology of losing my mother when I was relatively young I think one of the things that I learned from that is, okay, you can't depend on people continuing to live. You've got to take every day as if you appreciate it for what it is. And years ago, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I'm completely fine at this point, but I was struck by how many of my friends said, oh, you must be so angry, you must be thinking, why me? And I was thinking, I'm not thinking, why me? I'm thinking, boy, I at least got to outlive my poor mother who died at 44. Life is hard. Um, But I've I've been struck, there are many people, and I'm basically at the cusp of the baby boom generation, who hadn't had a serious loss in their life until their 50s. They haven't lost a parent or sometimes a beloved grandparent. But um, if you don't have some degree of suffering, and it makes a huge difference as to whether people are responsive to your suffering when that happens, then how do you develop resiliency? So I do have some sense, I always worry that it's easy to imagine that our predecessors were healthier than we were in certain ways. I've been reading uh, Pinker's book on the decline of violence. And uh, it's beginning to make me feel as if we're much better off than previous generations in some ways. So I don't want to make a Garden of Eden myth. But at the same time, I do think there's something that's changed about resilience. I I, I know people who have had a lot of indulgence of one kind or another often aren't very good at solving problems because somehow it's been done for them. So I, I don't know. I, that, is that generally in It also taps upon what you said about reality testing. <coughs> there is a lack of reality testing nowadays. Yes. Because we live in a, we live in an informal it's it's a different planet we live on sometimes. Yes. It's not sometimes really this one. So I remember when I was lecturing in Russia some years ago, the Russians said to me, What is it with you Americans? I you know, here we just say shit happens. <laughs> but when you have shit happen, you say, who am I going to sue? Who is responsible? <laughs> <laughs> and you can certainly go too far in the direction of, yeah, shit happens, we're all helpless. But you can also go too far in the direction of, we have to fix everything because it shouldn't be this way. Yes, I to follow on this, um, uh, uh, you remind me of Juliet Hopkins, you know, Baldi's uh, granddaughter or niece, um, who is also at the Tavistock Clinic uh, child psychotherapist. Huh. And she wrote a, a, an article a few years ago about the too good mother. 
Oh, yes. We are not good enough. Yes, too good. Too, too good. Uh, which amounts to uh, not allowing really your child to think for themselves or develop any skills. Yes. And as a consequence, uh, they, they feel castrated really uh, of, of their um, potency, of, be, of yes. their resilience, of learning things to, to be able to stand on their own. This agency, as you said. Um, yes, did everyone hear that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I've seen it, and I agree. Uh, I think it's a, a tendency that's maybe even more common in therapists than in the rest of the population to have a fantasy that we could be the good mother. Um, and we treat everything with empathy rather than setting limits, having consequences for behavior, using bribes and threats the way parents have from time to memorial, <coughs> motivating children that way. I don't think parenting is the same thing as being a psychotherapist, even though there are ways in which our patients take us in as if we were. But um, even then, I suppose, if it's sort of to, to follow Winnicott, that it, it's during the failures of the parent yes. that the child uh, develops these uh, Skills and, and it's during the failures of the therapist that, the, the, therapy that the therapy progresses. Yeah. You know, it, it, there's nothing more healing to a dyad or to the patient than the therapist acknowledging a mistake, yeah. non-defensively, apologizing for it, and demonstrating that you don't <coughs> have to build your self-esteem around being perfect all the time. It's very touching to people. People often remember that from their own psychotherapy experience. That even even very classical analysts who don't tend to uh, say things like "I apologize," they will still find a way to convey that um, okay, you experienced me as insensitive, and I can understand why. And if the patient feels that that the therapist can acknowledge mistakes, it's hugely important. which ought to be a, a comfort for beginning therapists. <laughs> really, I mean, you're training to be a surgeon and you make a mistake. <laughs> you're in trouble. <laughs> but if you're training to be a therapist, your mistakes you can build on, usually. There was a question here. Yes, uh, I don't know what you said about uh, not only the psychoanalytic and psychotherapy, but psychotherapy in general, the field of psychotherapy is changing dramatically. And I've seen that in my personal <laughs> therapy also. It's becoming more of uh, using techniques yes. of uh, making uh, the patient or the client uh, more um, functioning. Uh, and actually, the, the whole uh, project of having therapy, the whole process of having therapy, uh, is focused on how to make uh, the reducement of the symptoms to make the person functioning and a little room for growth yes. in the patient exists or even overall evaluation right uh, even the patients come to you and say I, I just want to be more functioning in my work right I want to be popular yes I want to be beautiful and famous and rich and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> exactly um, the social sciences, uh, not exactly the field of psychology. Actually, I was, but I left because of all the reasons you see yes. through this. So, uh, trying to find a master's or an institute to, to have psychotherapy, to be a psychotherapist at one point, a psychoanalytic psychotherapist, I just see that it's so changing. And it's more like... Um, some of the magic words yes. to do the technique I, I need to do right. to make you better. Right. So what do I do as someone who wants to study further and how really help people not succeed in the field of psychotherapy? Yes. With the <coughs> Find a training program where people speak your language. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Which part well, of the world? There's a relational group <laughs> in Athens and in Thessaloniki, I think, for example. Uh, I don't. I know some people in that group. I think they're good. Are you finding it consistent with the way you think and talking in terms of 
larger issues than symptom reduction. Do you think that there's going to be any some kind of movement, for example, like 60s or 70s, do we have Thomas Satch or... I'm hoping to start one, actually. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm hoping to be part of one. I think therapists everywhere are feeling this. We're feeling like the insurance companies and the drug companies have defined what we do. They've taken our profession out from under us. And uh, it's very corrupting. We learn to speak in the terms that the insurance companies recognize. We focused on target symptoms. Uh, The person had one or two fewer negative self discussions. Um, So that's why I'm thinking of doing this book. I'm trying to, and and I deliberately am thinking of trying to make it cross over to the larger culture because it's the larger culture also that's starting to think now about psychotherapy as just getting rid of symptoms. It's changed the way people talk about themselves. It used to be that people would come in and they'd say, I'm a very shy person, and I need to learn how to do better in social situations. And now they come in and they say, I have social phobia. You have a technique for that. And it's there, there's a kind of estrangement from the self in describing yourself as having something. And the drug companies are very implicated in this. For example, when... Eli Lilly lost the patent on Prozac when enough years went by. They made the same chemical formula into a pink pill. They invented the term PMDD, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, and they marketed the pill for this. Now, I have no objection to the idea that some women suffer a lot when they're premenstrual and that maybe occasionally a medication might help them with it. But the idea of their inventing PMDD, a disease that you have to medicate, disturbs me greatly. And this, we see the ramifications of this everywhere. I, you know, we are seeing some interesting political movements in the United States now that are various kinds of resistances to the power of the drug companies and the insurance companies. I don't know, and one of their slogans is, we're all Greeks now. (laughs) They were all at the mercy of these huge international conglomerate corporations. I wondered what that meant. Uh, I thought maybe we would have been that they they mean that overall things we have to be medicated. (laughs) No, what they mean was we are all dealing with having our intimate lives controlled by forces that have to do with an international economy that we have no influence on. Yeah, I was listening the other day on the BBC, on BBC uh, a criticism <coughs> about the DSM that somehow it functions now, the, the latest decision, on the basis of what the insurance companies yes. want. And uh, it, it's, it, 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 it's getting it's getting less meaningful. Yes, I feel strongly about that. There were there was a group of humanistic psychologists in the American Psychological Association that started a petition against DSM five. Yeah. And to their amazement, it's been signed by something like forty thousand people. It's been halted now, hasn't it? It's a it's a grassroots movement. And I read that they're putting um, publication on hold so it can be further reviewed on specific issues. Yes, they are. The problem for the uh, American Psychiatric Association is now that they have developed rules that drug companies can't bribe doctors the way they used to. You know, they used to invite doctors to elaborate fancy vacations and feed them, and they they eliminated those perquisites. But as a result, their main source of money now is the DSM. (laughs) There was a period a few years ago when some psychiatrists, because a a large number of psychiatrists still want to be therapists, not medicators, or not just medicators. They started objecting to the DSM, and there was a movement within the American Psychiatric Association (coughs) to get rid of the DSM, but it made them so much money that they couldn't even face that possibility. So, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, 
I, I, I do understand this concern about insurance companies. I'm not even going to the pharmaceuticals, the drug companies. Yes. I think that needs to be addressed. It's a major issue. Uh, but thinking of the world in terms of systems, it is a give and take. If somebody's yes. going to have to dish out a whole lot of money for people's therapy, there, there needs to be some ways to measure yes. if that money is going to, uh, is having an impact in some way. I agree. I think accountability is a good thing. Right. However, one of the problems with the private insurance model is that there's no long-term concern. People in the United States, at least, what insurance you have is based on your job, and people change jobs a lot. So the insurance company doesn't have a long-term view. They also evaluate their benefits managers on an annual basis. How much did you save the stockholders this year? Now, there's a really good book out this year by Susan Lazar called Psychotherapy is Worth It that puts together all the evidence, and it's quite vast, for the preventive effects of psychotherapy. The more people have psychotherapy, the earlier and the more frequently they have it, the fewer sick days they have in work, the less physical illnesses they have, the less likely they are to go to jail, the less likely they are to develop a substance abuse disorder. Now, if a government had a single payer system, the government might have more of a long-range view because that would save tremendous amounts of money. But we have to make that argument. Uh, and, and we're going against incredibly powerful forces in the United States to try to change our structure of health care. Obama moved us you know, about three inches, and he's still being you know, vilified by the right wing for socializing. <laughs> yes. I had a question among what you're talking about, because I think similar to what you think, and I believe in that kind of therapy. And my question is always, who can pay yeah. for the years of therapy that we talk about? Because yeah. we know that people don't change in two weeks or in two months, or mm -hmm. for the most part, no matter what the insurance companies say. Yeah. So on the social level, how can this work be done and not addressed just to the very rich? Mm -hmm. It's a question that I always... I, I struggle with that too. What your thoughts were about that. I mean, we all have personal <coughs> solutions to it. Probably like me, you have some patients who are wealthy, who you ask for uh, a regular fee, and some that you see for very little money because it's part of many therapists' self-esteem to want to treat not just the rich. But um, I do remember a time when insurance companies covered long-term psychotherapy and where working class and poor people could get real therapy. And in Scandinavia, that's still true. They are relatively wealthy countries, though. Uh, in in uh, Sweden, a few years ago, they took psychoanalysis, not psychoanalytic therapy, but four times a week analysis off what they would pay for by the national government, and there was a grassroots uprising, and they put it back in. So if you have a population that believes that psychotherapy is valuable, then it can become one of the things that government tries to offer people, including in the long run, because it saves costs. But we're very far from that now, and we're all dealing with these moral questions of who is going to help the poor. They go to these agencies that treat them like a revolving door, mm -hmm. and they get uh, exhausted therapists yeah. and beginning therapists, and they think they've tried therapy and it didn't help them, when in fact they've not ever had real mm -hmm. discipline psychotherapy from any theoretical perspective. So I don't know, I struggle with this personally, I struggle thinking about it politically, but I think what we do is of enormous value, value to people, a lot more than some other things that government supports. So I would like to see it supported at a, a more political level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd like to go back to the previous issue, because mm -hmm. you said that some patients come and tell us I have social phobia instead yeah. of telling us I'm shy. Mm -hmm. And you were saying before that your colleague was asking you how did you use this line yes. from your vulgar lines. Right. And it's like our patients are also giving us and telling us lines mm -hmm. about things. Yes. Maybe somehow they respond to us. 
And I wonder, do, do we really, as therapists, as mental health specialists, do we want to see mental health beyond symptom relief? Because this also requires something else from us, another function, yeah. another level of availability. Mm -hmm. And we'll to explore. I, I, can, I, I guess I can As understand it also maybe with personal boundaries, our own protection sometimes. <coughs> Especially for us here in Greece, under yes. those difficult circumstances. Yes. I, I think it's a very individual thing, what your version of what you would act is. There are some psychiatrists who like to be medicated. They don't want to talk to people. They just want to hear their symptoms and medicate. And there are others that are terribly frustrated that they can't be the kinds of therapists they want to be. So I think a patient could pick that up easily. <coughs> that the Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you.